So, what did we talk about last time? One thing we haven't talked about is that this Wednesday, I think I asked you to submit homework. First assignment, correct? Oh, Wednesday? Yeah, this today. Wednesday. No? So today. Uh, you said today. Uh, so let's make it Wednesday. Since I'm not going to grade it. So you said today, wonderful. So you are prepared, Uber prepared for today, and now I'm telling you Wednesday. Okay? So uh, hold it uh, with you. Uh, I'll collect it on Wednesday, all right, guys? So that was assignment number one. Another thing you should have done is homework number one and compared to my solution. So if you if you're having problem with this again, try to talk to me, talk with me. I uh, actually today I had a student that came to to meet the student for office hours. So if you email me, I'll try to meet you as well. So anyhow, so what did we talk about last time? So one thing we mentioned is that a set is countable. So A is countably infinite. And we had several descriptions of that. First description is that there is a function f from the natural numbers to A, and it is one to one and on to, known as bijective. That's one implication. The second implication that we, we had is not as restrictive. Such a function will exist as long as, well, it's actually stating the same thing. It means that A can be written in a sequence. So that would be A1, A2, A3, and that's why we call it countable is that we can arrange all the elements in A, even though there are infinitely many elements in A, we can arrange them in order. So this is the first, if you, if you use Hilbert Hotel analogy, this guy <coughs> is in room 1, this guy is in room 2, this guy is in room 3, right? The Hilbert Hotel has as many rooms as the natural numbers, the integers. Another thing we noticed then is that is that if I can take a function uh, from A, so if there, if there exists a function G from A to some infinite subset. descriptions that we can use for for countable sets okay this is the straightforward definition but then we we'll observe that every subset every infinite subset of a countable set is itself countable okay so if I can exhibit a one-to-one -one relationship between a and some infinite subset of the natural numbers I exhibited a relationship between a and the natural numbers since that subset is itself countable make sense so where did, it, where did it help us? We, we were able to then say that, that Q is countable. Q is countable. And why was Q countable? Because I can think of Q as equal to Q plus union Q minus and maybe union zero. So this would be a union of at most countable sets, and any countable unit of at most uh, union of at most countable sets must be countable. So how do I know that Q plus is countable? So Q plus, I can think of the numbers in Q plus as arranged uh, in, a, in a matrix with repetition. So I can think of it as one divided by one, one divided by two, one divided by three, one divided by four, and onwards, that, so that would be the first infinite row. The, the second infinite row is 2 divided by 1. 2 divided by 2. 2 divided by 3. 2 divided by 4. 
and onwards, and uh, then I can think of the next is going to be 3 divided by 1, 3 divided by 2, 3 divided by 3, 3 divided by 4, and onwards. And onwards. Now, the way you can, uh, you can try to count is you can say this guy is first, then you can go diagonally, right? So this is first, second, third. Uh, this would be like this. So four, fifth, six, like this, etc. Okay? But notice that in doing this counting, if you think of it as though those are the members of the team, they have those jerseys. They have, let's say, let's say 2 over 2 is the same as 1 over 1, right? So what you have done, you have given, let's say, the integer 1, you have given it infinitely many rooms to choose from. One is the room number 1. Another is room number 5. Another is the room corresponding to 3 over 3. There are going to be infinitely many choices, right? But you can then say each of those numbers will, will, will have those infinitely many choices and among those choices will pick the smallest room available. Right? In this case, one will pick the room number one. Right? One half will pick room number three. It will have infinitely many choices, but it will pick one. And therefore, what, what this exhibits is not a one-to-one -one relationship with the natural numbers, but really a one-to-one -one relationship with a subset of the natural numbers. Does this make sense? Subset. But because of this property, I know that already implies countable, okay? So although I haven't exhibited how to count Q, I haven't told you how to assign the row numbers in an implicit function, I just said each of them has infinitely many choices but picks one, so therefore there is going to be a correspondence from Q plus is equivalent to some, some subset of the natural numbers which I can represent as n1, n2, n3, n4, etc. Some of the rooms will not be picked, okay? Because you see what, what it means is that when I assign q plus into those rooms, some rooms remain empty. Okay, but that means that it's equivalent to the natural numbers. That's by one of the theorems that we have. Another thing to keep in mind, so, so if I have Q plus equivalent to the natural numbers, and then uh, Q minus will be equivalent to the natural numbers, union of countable sets, a countable union to be precise, of countable sets, is countable. Yes? Do you understand? Do you see this, right? Which we showed how to do it. So that tells us that using this procedure, this is countable. And we also learned that the infinity of the natural numbers is the smallest infinity there could be. careful when you say smallest infinity, this infinity is usually denoted, so if you say this is the cardinality of the set n, you usually write it as Aleph null. Aleph may be for the Hebrew letter Aleph, meaning God, Elohim, God, the, the God, uh, basically the person that uh, considered this mathematics, Gerber Cantor, it was religious, so my, it might be because he associated it with God. I'm sorry, I don't know if we went over the fact that infinity of the natural numbers is a space. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention that, right? So I just stated this thing, what do I mean that it's the smallest? Well, take any infinite set. We show that any infinite set necessarily contains a countable subset. Okay? You see that? Any infinite set contains a countable infinity. So, in that, sense, in that sense, it implies that if you have an infinite set, it already is at least countable, maybe more. Okay? 
but it cannot be less because if it's infinite, then it will have uh, it will definitely have a countable subset. That's what I mean by smallest in this context. Okay. But what if you have something like um, not your natural numbers, but your uh, sorry, not your factors, but your uh, multiples of five? Yes. Well, that's uh, that. If you just what do you mean integers that are multiple of five? Natural numbers that are multiples of five. Okay, so that is uh, what five, twenty-five, etc. Right, five, ten, and then what, what five, not, right? 10, 15, 20. Right. That's a smaller infinity, though. No, it's the same infinity, not smaller, because uh, you can you can rearrange it. Although it's a subset, right? It, it is a, it is no bigger than the infinity of the natural numbers, as it is a subset. But uh, it is exactly equal to the natural numbers. You can you can reassign them, and it's exactly equal to the. You you, ha you can exhibit. A bijection between that set and the set of natural numbers. So then your rational numbers are also the same cardinality. Exactly, they're exactly the same cardinality. I didn't say anything else. And, and, I, and we haven't, we only brushed, I only mentioned in the last two minutes of class that there might be bigger infinities. Okay? So as far as you're concerned, maybe it's completely nonsensical, all infinities are countable. Maybe that's the case. Okay? You all are clear on, the, on that, on that uh, sense? I mean, we, all of this can be just justified rigorously and, it, and slowly we do that. But you see, if I have a big set and from it I take a, a, a subset and that subset is countable, so I see that the big set, it seems, is at least as large as, uh, as uh, its subset. Right? But the subset, that's the weird thing. The subset, although many of you think the subset is obviously smaller, no. Based on this definition, the subset might be exactly the same size as the full set. As you said, let's say multiples of 2 easier than multiples of 5, right? The set 2, 4, 6, 8, etc., even numbers, it's a proper subset of the natural numbers. So you might think, oh, it's smaller. No, it is not. I can arrange it in one-to-one, onto -one, fashion. In other words, I just divide by 2 and I get back the natural numbers. It is exactly the same size. That's the idea. The natural numbers are exactly as big as any infinite subset of the natural numbers. The only thing that's confusing then is um, the definition that you said infinity of natural numbers is the smallest infinity, because then you can say infinity of the rational numbers is the smallest infinity. Yes, they are the same. So they, they are the same infinity, so, so, it's not the smallest so infinity. Uh, they, are, they are the same and they are the smallest. If, you have, uh, if you, you have the smallest infinity, you cannot have infinity smaller than the natural numbers. If it's infinity, there will be a subset of the natural numbers, okay? Well, well maybe when we we'll go and talk about Bernstein's theorem, those ideas will be more rigorously understood, okay? But intuitively, here's what I'm saying again, intuitively. If I have a big set and I take a proper subset of it, the proper subset, it should be weird if it's larger, do you agree? Let's say if I, if I have a bag and out of it I take some subset, some, 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 not, all the, not all the elements, but only part of the elements I have in the bag, the cardinality should not be bigger. That seems intuitive, right? It could be the same. That's the, the unintuitive part. It could be the same. Okay. So, finally, would you mind if I erase this all done? So now we are going to try to establish bigger infinities, but they do exist. So this, this is the idea. So we are claiming the interval from 0 to 1. This is a subset of R. So that means all the real numbers between 0 and 1, they, are, they can be placed in order. This set is uncountable.
important aspect of the proof is that if x is an element of 0, 1, x can be written as 0 point a1, a2, a3, and so on. That's in base 10. I can use any other base, but I'll use base 10. And what this means is that x can be written as the summation where n starts with 1 goes to infinity, a sub n over 10 to the power of n. And that's the same thing as a1 over 10 plus a2 over 10 squared and and so on. Okay? That's, that's one of the things that you have to understand in this class very well. And you should understand that furthermore. Furthermore, if the a sub n are not eventually zero, zero, this representation is unique. part of homework one that you don't have to hand in, you, you should really try to verify that you can justify this argument. So what do I mean by that? Here is what I mean by that. So if, if I take 0 0.5, right, 0 0.5 means that after a sub 1, a sub 1 being 5, all the remaining numbers are 0, okay? This is 1 half. But this can also be written as 0 0.4 9, 9, 9, and the 9s repeat. Okay? So 1 half has two representations in base 10. One of them, 5 over 10 plus 0 over 10 squared, 0 over 10 cubed, etc. And the other is 4 over 10 plus 9 over 10 squared plus 9 over 10 cubed, etc. The infinite representation is unique. There is only one infinite representation. If you, and some numbers do have finite representations. Okay? One third doesn't. One third is only 0 0.33333. It only has one representation, the infinite one. It doesn't have any other in base 10. But one quarter does. 0 0.25 is the finite. 0 0.249999 is the infinite one. The infinite representation is always unique. Okay? So then what Cantor does, he, he, he goes about, so what does it mean? That this set is not countable. Think about it, right? He was German, and Germans are really good at bureaucracy, excellent bureaucrats. They are very good at, you know, at putting people in lines and making them go where they have to go. Yes? Question. Mm -hmm. are all rush, do all rational numbers have an infinite and, uh, and uh, finite? Do both rational numbers have two um, have two representations? Base space p representations. Rational numbers only in one particular base. Again, one third in base ten has only one uh, base ten representation. That's why, yeah, right. That's why it's confusing. So you, you, depending on the base that you pick, I, uh, irrational numbers never have more than one representation, no matter what base you pick. Okay. Right. Rational numbers, each rational number, you can pick a base in which it will have two representations. Two? Yeah. So how do you... How do you so example one third. If I, I, one third in base three will have two representations. <coughs> and one third will be represented as 0 0.1 base three or uh, 0 0.02222 in base uh, three. Okay, I'll again. 
Don't go over your head, fine. Sure. We'll, we can talk about it another time. Okay. In a specific base P, but not in a specific in base P. If, if you give me a rational number and allow me to select the base, I can make it, uh, I can make it have two uh, representations. That makes sense. Right. But in general, most, many numbers will have only one. Each number definitely has in the infinite representation. Okay, so now you understand what, what countable means. I, the, my, my, my analogy would be then the DMV. Okay? So you have a very efficiently running DMV, but you have an influx of citizens, infinitely many citizens. Now, what does it mean that the number of citizens is countable? It means that there is some procedure by which I can arrange them in a queue line where one individual is first, another is second, another is third. Each of them has a ticket, and the ticket has a number that tells him where in line he stands. It could be that you are standing the billionth person, the trillionth person in line, but you are standing in line. Uncountable infinity is like a, it's, it's worse than a Soviet, uh, you know, a Soviet queue line to the supermarket. Well, there was no supermarket, there were some other things. Venezuela, if you think, right? So that means that there, there would always be some poor sub running, running around trying to find his place in line, but he can never do that. And it's not the fault of the administration. The administration is powerless to do anything about it. No matter how the arrangement is done, it's impossible to put everybody in a queue line. Do you understand? That, would, that, that is what it means viscerally when you're saying that the set is uncountable. It, it is impossible to put things in order. If you like the Hilbert hotel analogy, it's impossible to assign one individual to one integer numbered hotel. So how did Cantor try to prove it? Here, here you go. So I'm going to first try the abstract explanation. And then I'm going to give you like uh, some numbers so for you to understand how that works, all right? So, so suppose that so suppose to the contrary that you were able to make such uh, such an arrangement. This is, so, So suppose that you did make this uh, this this cataloging of zero. So suppose suppose that the interval of zero one is countable. Suppose it's countable. Then. There was a listing, so I can I can list zero one, all its elements. So I can say the first element was written in, in infinite decimal expansion as zero point, x one, one, x two, two, x, sorry, x one two, x. One three x one four and onwards. The expansion is infinite. Okay. So what I mean by that is again somebody somehow was able to place everybody in line. So this guy, whatever he might be, he is the first in line. Okay. So some so some other guy, whatever he might be, he is the second in line. So you see the first index means that he's first in line. So that would be zero point x21, x22, x23, x24, etc. Those are the unique infinite representations in base 10 for the numbers, uh, for the numbers in 0, 1. So 3, we have 0 0.x31, x32, x33, x34, and onwards. And let's maybe write one more. At 0 0.x41, x42, x43, 
x4, 4, four and onwards. And this, of course, this list goes on. Here is what's important in the list. So why is it called diagonalization? I'm going to select the diagonal where integers, uh, the index of, uh, of the x and the place are the same, right? So I'm going to select the first digit in the first number in the listing, the second digit in the second number of the listing, the third digit in the third listing, the fourth. You see, that's why you have the diagonal. 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4. That's where the diagonalization argument refers to. So, then what I'm going to say is I'm going to produce a number y. So, from this, from this you take y to equal, to equal 0 0.y1, y2, y3, y4, and onwards. Okay? So, uh, where I would say that y sub n is going to be equal to it's going to be equal to say 2 if x and n is not equal to 2 and it's going to be equal to let's say if x and n is 3. Okay? So, let me just give you an example. Okay? It has to be done abstractly, otherwise the argument doesn't work. But in the example, suppose that somebody tried to arrange, so suppose that the first number was 0 0.3578, etc. And the second number was 0 0.0249, etc. The third number was 0 0.50. Five zero um, five zero two five etc. Fourth number zero point three 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 etc. Okay. X and M equals two or, or three there. Uh, two. Yeah. Thank you. Two. Okay. So let's see what what y, what y would be produced in this case. If this were, was the sequence, how would I produce the y? So again, what I do is I need to determine the diagonal. So I take this is my first number. This is the second number. This is the third number, and this is the fourth number. Yes? You follow? That's what, what the diagonalization so the diagonalization tell me, tells me to construct y as follows. So this y in this case would be zero. So here I see not two, so I put two. Yes? Zero point two. What do I put here? Three. Three. What do I put here? Three. What do I put here? Two. Two. And onwards. Okay? So that's the, the y that is constructed. So now look what happens. Now this y is nowhere on the list. How do I know it's nowhere on the list? Well, let's first look at this number example. Could this y be the first number on the list? It cannot, right? Because the first digit of the first number on the list is 3. My first digit is 2. So this guy is not the first on the list. Could it be the second on the list? 
No. And why is it not the second on the list? Because the two contradicts the three. Right. So I, what I do, I compare them digit by digit. So I see that he is not the second in the list because the second digit of y does not match the second digit of the number on the list. Is it third on the list? No, because the third digit of y does not match the third digit on the list. Okay? Not fourth, not fifth, not sixth, based on this example. Okay? Now, you see, uh, why do I have to do it abstractly? This is not necessarily the right arrangement of 0 0.1. This is just saying, suppose somebody claims that they created the right arrangement. He couldn't be right, because if this were the arrangement, the y will not match the first digit will not match the second digit of the second number on the list, will not match the third digit of the third number on the list, etc. Yes. Um, but it's the XNN isn't unique, right? We it is unique. That's very important. It is unique. No, I'm saying as long as it covers all of the all of the guys in the list, it'll it'll work. So for example we could do an X N N N plus one. So as we could start from x12, then go to x23, x34, and etc., and that guy would never be on the list either. Well, I might have missed your, your point again, right? Uh, um, there might be many ways of comparing whether a number is on the list or not, so I'm using a very quick, a quick comparison. That's what I'm saying. Right. And n is the simplest one? I'm not sure about simplest, it's just, it's just we see. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty neat, right? I know how to compare and I don't need to look through some arbitrary numbers, right? I could have done some other procedure. That's what I'm this saying. This clearly yeah. is, a, is a procedure that works. Other procedures obviously are possible. Yeah. Well, I mean, I should say it seems very natural that the other procedures uh, they, they could exist. But the point is, two things to note. The numbers are represented uniquely. They are infinite expansions. That's very important. Otherwise, uh, maybe, maybe it also are different digits, yet you get a number on the list. I'm going to show you how you can make a mistake in this in a moment. Okay? So you have to be really careful. Those numbers are all assumed to have infinite expansions, so it does not terminate in zeros. No, no, none of those numbers terminate in zeros. That's first assumption. Second ass assumption is, uh, well, that's it. Pretty much that's all I need. Right? But then I, I know that such a presentation is unique. So may I, may I erase? So, so, so this tells us that uh, this tells us that zero interval zero one cannot be counted. So the implication is zero one cannot be counted. Cannot, it is not counted. I'll put y. Do you understand why? Countable is equivalent with arranging in a Q-line, arranging in a sequence. Zero, 1 cannot be arranged in a sequence based on this argument. So I, I'll make this remark. By the way, Remark is a really good author, wrote Dry Kameraden, Three Comrades, everybody should read the book, one of the best book. If you want to read the book. But the Remark is different. The Remark is, uh, be careful. Now, why should you be careful? So, suppose I do a similar procedure, uh, and I just uh, and I and I have a different. Uh, notice in this in this in this procedure, I used the digit two and three. Okay, so be careful. Yeah, so suppose that I uh, suppose that I have the list. My list is something like zero point uh, four.
number is 0 0.5 So the first box is around 4, the next box is around 9, the next box is around this 9, the next box is around this 9. And suppose that I, I have the following procedure, right? So, so, so I'm going to say that y equal to y equal to 0 0.y1, y2, y3, and so on. And I'm gonna and I'm gonna use something like this. I'm gonna say that y sub n will be equal to so it will be equal to let's say zero if x and n is equal to and it will equal and it would equal to five if x and n isn't nine. Now what happens in that case? So what we have is y will then equal to zero point. So the first number is not equal to uh, is not equal to nine. So I replace it by uh, I replace it by uh, by by five. Right. On the other hand, the next number is equal to nine. So then I put zero here. The next number is nine, so I put uh, zero here, and so on. I have zeros. Right, uh, so one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and so on. Okay? Now look what happens. Uh, this number is actually the same as the one that I, uh, that I had at two. See, 0 0.499 is the same as 0 0.500. Okay. Now, one one danger is you have to be careful. You should probably avoid um, swapping digits like nine. Avoid the digit nine. I avoid, avoid the digit zero. If you avoid, that's in base ten. Okay. Avoid the extreme digits. Avoid the smallest digits. Avoid the biggest digit, and you'll be fine. Sir, but that's assuming that every other n n term is a nine. Well, yes, that's what I'm saying, right? Now, what, I'm, what I'm showing is that uh, this procedure, if you're not careful, will not necessarily lead to a number not on the list, right? Yes, I am assuming that all the others in the diagonal, all the others will be nine. It's possible, right? So, so what I mean is that this di this diagonalization procedure, is, you, you might want to say that. By this procedure, this number is nowhere on the list, but you are mistaken. It's the second number on the list. So if it's assumed that x n n equals uh, uh, nine, nine uh, right. or except for the first one, uh, the, the first one, uh, yes, uh, the first the, 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 only the first one. So if, if 2 is going to be 0.49999 all the way, it will eventually converge to 0.5. Yes. And you already gave that assumption that it does not converge. No, I, I, I didn't speak about, of okay. course, this converges. This number is 1 half. This number is 1 half, and so is this number in base 10. Okay? What I just wanted to show, why should you be careful, is that you can produce incorrect, you can, produce, you can get to an incorrect conclusion if you are not careful with this argument. That's all I wanted to say. You follow me? Right. Yep. So what about like if I take the sum from one to infinity of one over ten to the n, right? Okay. And that would be like the first element, and then I just 
Add 1 over 10 to the infinity. That would be the next element. Forever. What, 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 what you're saying is, uh, is yeah, so let me just, let's see, so you're asking me, so you, you, have, you have a number 1 over 10 plus 1 over 10 squared plus etc. Okay? Yeah, yeah. And then, what I, so that's, that's your number, maybe I, I am allowed to call it S. And then what are you saying? Just add 1 over 10 to the infinity. What is 1 over 10 to the infinity? Uh, that, that makes no sense. Well, uh, those are, those are uh, positive integers. If you, if you say 1 over 10 to this symbol, this symbol from calculus only means growth, growth without bound. So this is really identical when you say limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over 10 to the n, but that will be just 0. If you mean, but, but, but this symbol is meaningless in our, uh, in our language. Okay? This is only when you talk this, this, this thing, it's uh, growth without bound. Okay, and we, we show that's that's the first lecture. That's the weird thing about the balls uh, that they, or the uni, or the stars in the universe. What I meant is, you, you saw that that by twelve the number was growing and becoming very large, but uh, uh, but but at twelve the number ended up in one case being zero. Okay? So that's why this thing is not infinity at all. It only is an indicator that something is some quantity is increasing. So can I change it then? So 1.1 1 .1 minus the sum from 1 to infinity of, of 1 over 10 to 9. So change this. But this, this, this is, so maybe that was lost, then I have to go. So go on. Uh, so you said, so you said uh, 1.1? Yeah. So, one so, so the original thing, S is the same. S is, is the same, okay, so it is uh, 0 0.1 bar, and then, and what was the And that's just like 1.1 minus the sum. 1.1 minus? The sum from uh, n equals 0 to infinity. Of what? Of uh, 1 over 10 to the n. So 1.1 minus 0 0.1 bar. That's what you did, but so, so what is this? Then this is the same as uh, 1.0. Uh, 9 bar uh, minus uh, 0 0.1 bar. Uh, no, what do I say? Uh, so, no, so, 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 uh, so this is this is going to be just the same as uh, 1 minus. Uh, minus 0 0.01 bar, so that would be equal to 0, uh, point, uh, 0 0.99, right, if I'm not, uh, yeah. right, I'm not, I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out a way to add, you know, 1 over 10 to the end, you know, point 0.1, but, but put the, uh, infinite zeros of the 1 at the end, right? represent that somehow? That it, it, there is no end. If you have infinitely many zeros, then, uh, uh, then what do you mean the end? You go, it's not in the fifth place, not in the sixth. There are some, some ideas like that, that uh, but uh, a little beyond what we talk in this class. There, I mean, you have to be careful what do you mean at the end. I have to go on, guys, if you have more questions about things like that, I have to talk later. So, so what we, we know is that, uh, so hopefully you see that 0, 1, this is not countable. And that the implication is that R is not countable. Do you see why? Very simply, if R were countable, every infinite subset would have been. 
but 0 0.01 is it. So notice that R can be written that R is written as the, the rational numbers union whatever else is in R that is not rational, that is the irrational number, right? And the implication is that this is not countable as well. The irrational numbers cannot be counted. If, it, if they could have, then we have a union of two countable sets, and that would mean again that R is countable but we show that it isn't. So, so irrational numbers, in a sense, they must be much more of them. Does there exist a different proof that uh, irrational numbers are countable without taking into account the real numbers? That irrationals are, yes, you can use the regularization. Again, irrational numbers, you can identify them with, uh, with, with numbers whose infinite expansion in base 10, let's say, is never repeating. So let's say number like 0 0.123, 1 to 3, 1 to 3 will be rational. Uh, you can calculate easily what the, the number is like, um, I think, uh, what you do, you, mul you multiply by a thousand, you know, I, I don't know, I got the procedure, right? So, so if, 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 if there is no repeating pattern, that must be, you can show by division algorithm that if it's rational, there will be a repeating pattern. If it is irrational, there will be no repeating string of digits eventually. have to be careful. I mean, maybe the organization, uh, would, you have to be careful in applying it because in that case, how do you know you, you, you would produce a new number, but maybe you produce a rational number. Who knows, right? So this is the easiest path I can think of. All right. So then the question is, uh, is there, is, does there, is, there is no smallest infinity. So first of all, uh, we have this definition. And the definition is that given a set A, the power set Example would be if A is just equal to the number 1, 2, then the power set of A would be a collection of set, subsets that would be the empty set, the singleton 1, the singleton 2, and one, two. Yes? So in a way in a way if I only had two students in the class, the power set are all the possibilities of how many students would show up. So it could be that nobody shows up, only student number one or student number two, or all of them show up. 
Okay, so the power set is the set of all possibilities. It can be also identified with all possible attendance rosters. In other words, assign each element either 0 or 1. So in a way, that would be 2 to the power. Okay? Notice that this was the size here. The size of A was 2. The size of the power set of A is 2 squared. So with, with, uh, with finite, you know, in, with, with the finite case, it's pretty clear that the power set is bigger than, than the set A. So, is it still true in the infinite case? So let's just fix language. I haven't fully justified that language, but let's fix a language so you, that again, I'm hoping you are clear when I say bigger than, less than, okay? So uh, we say, we would say this. We would say that well, I'll say definition star, right? It might, it, the definition might be wrong. Right? You have to be careful there. Definition, you might say that uh, given set A, B, we have, we, would, we say, we say that the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of B if there exists a function F from A to B. Now tell me what that function is. Think about it, right? A is, is less than the size of A is no bigger than the size of B. So what must be the case? Think about the fingers, right? So A is this set, B is this set. What do I mean when I say the cardinality of the set A is no bigger than the cardinality of the set B? What, what that function is doing? What function exists? What was that function that I showed? Well, from A to, uh, to B, it's 1 to 1, right? 1 to 1, but not on to if, if it's not on to, may, maybe, it's, maybe another function will also be on to, we don't know, right? But uh, if, if there exists an, an injective map, then it implies that the cardinality of A is no bigger than the cardinality of B. So if there exists F from A to B, uh, that is... It, I, I didn't say that, I say less than or equal, right? So that is one to one. Okay. So an example of that will be, as you mentioned, if I take the even numbers. So let's say two to times the natural numbers, um, and I can just take the identity map onto the natural numbers. So that, that what I'm saying then is that I take, let's say, the number two, I map it to the number two. The number four, I map to the number four. The number six, I map to the number six. But there are more numbers that I haven't, I haven't addressed. So in particular, there is the number one, the number three, the number, uh, the number five. I'm sorry. Yes. So. In that sense, that you're in that sense, that's why you, you were saying that uh, that the even numbers they look smaller than than all the numbers because there exists a, an injective map. But right away you see the injective map, but this one is not onto. But we showed uh, we we showed that there would be another. If you don't use the identity but use another function, there also exists one that is both injective and surjective, both one to one and onto. Okay. But then we know that the even numbers by this by this example are no bigger than the set of all numbers, and uh, th that's the first thing. And so you can you, you can then uh, you can obviously reverse it, right? So. Equivalently, you might say, so uh, equivalent 
Murphy. Oh, 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 let's say, let's say this, this has one. Let me say now this has two. I would say that the size of A is strictly less than the size of B if no map F from A to B is on to. So if it's impossible to be on to, then, uh, then you cannot have uh, intuitively, right? Intuitively, I can take those, uh, those three fingers, I can map them to two fingers, or at, at the very best, I can map it to three fingers, or to those three fingers, but I can never find one that is mapping to all the fingers. Okay? So not, if it's impossible to find that the map is onto, then I would say that the cardinality of the set B is bigger. Okay? So, again, counter me the following argument. No map. No map. set of A is onto. And that implies that the cardinality of A is always less than the cardinality of the power set of A, even if A is infinite. Okay? So this argument uh, you might not need it if you have a finite set, but it's not obvious in case A is infinite. Okay. So I will begin uh, by trying to explain how we thought about it and, uh, with an example. The example is useless actually, but I hope hopefully it, it helps you see the situation in the infinite field. Okay? So first uh, intuition. Given given a function f from a to the power set of a, I will construct <coughs> construct the set S sub f which is going to be the following. It's going to be x in A such that x is not in f of x. Okay? Now, you see that, that what happens here is that the function takes an element of, uh, of the set A to a subset of A. That's what this means. Okay. So let me try to explain what what, what this means. This uh, this what this means by, with a, a simple analogy. So suppose that suppose that the set A is very simply just the set of A, B, and C. So what, what, is, what, what are those A, B, and C? A is uh, one type of candy, B is another type of candy, and C is a third type of candy. Okay? And you go to the French baker. Okay? You go to the French baker, and what you, what you do is, suppose that this, this particular French baker is doing the following. Right? So, so you, have, uh, you have this function f of x so 
So what you do is when you come to the to the baker store, you're gonna point to uh, to a candy, okay? And when you point to a candy, you don't speak French. I know you do, but I don't, and that caused a lot of problems. You point to a candy, and this French guy is gonna give you a box. Now this box might contain the candy that you like, or it might not, okay? So let's say let's say this 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 F is for the for Frenchman, right? So this Frenchman, how do, does he react to you pointing at X? So suppose that if he, so suppose that he gives you he gives you a box. So the for the box that he gives you is uh, is going to be the box A B if X is equal to A. Okay. In other words, you point to that A. He gave you a box that contains the candy A and the candy B. But on the other hand, if you if you point to the candy B, he will give you C. He will give you a box containing only the candy C. And if you point to candy C, he'll be angry with you and give you nothing. He'll give you a box containing nothing whatsoever. Okay? So what is S? sub f, this is the set of dissatisfaction, right? When uh, the set f, it, it, it contains the candies that you point at, such that if you point at the, the, you know, point at those candies, you get a box that does not contain the candy. You are not happy, okay? Set of dis dissatisfaction. You see what it is, right? It's the, it is really the ones that you point at that you don't get. So what is that set in this case? Okay, could you tell me what belongs to that set? Well, I, I can start with A, right? If I point at A, it, am I going to get it in my box? So I look at A, and I look at F of A. F of A is the box I get. So it is inside, agreed? Okay? If I point at A, it's inside of the box, so A is not part of my dissatisfaction. It's not, it's not really uh, one of, the, of my grievance elements, right? Now, what about if I point at B? Now I take B, and I look at what I get if I point at B. Is it there? No. No, it is not there. So that means that B is in my set of dissatisfaction for that particular French baker. So that would be B is inside. Yes? So it's like A minus the range of F. You have to be careful. Right? It, it, is, it is different depending on the particular function. I gave you this function, the set of dissatisfaction is this, this. If I give you a different set, uh, sorry, if I give, give you a different function, different fr uh, French baker, it would be a different set. So just before we go, uh, what, what else is there? If I point at C, am I going to be dissatisfied? Yes. yes. So point at C, C is not an element of F of C, okay, and what you get is that the, the set is BC. Now notice that the set BC is a subset, it's part of the, of the power set, but it's none of the boxes that I will ever get by pointing at either A, B, or C, okay. So this procedure again is going to construct a set that is not uh, one that the function can produce. For every function, I will, I will produce a set that this function is not able uh, to be on, okay, to produce. So let me uh, change and just give you another example so that you, you see it a little better. Okay, so let's, let's change the function. So let's, so let's now have the following function. So let's suppose that again we have the same set A and you have this, the function from, it's G, it's a different baker, it's a function from A to the power set of A, and this time you're going to construct the set, so here is what happens, so you have G of X, G of X is the box that you're getting when you point to candy X, so it's going to be the set A, if X is A, it's going to be the set a, B, if X is equal to B, and it's going to be uh, B, C, if X is equal to 
C. So calculate, tell me what is S sub G. What is the set of dissatisfaction in this case? What, what is in it? Hmm? What can you say about this baker? <laughs> yes. You might try to say that if you if you go to Paris with me, you'll have to help me. I was was stuck for three hours. Or, actually, to be precise, 1.5. I think. Right? 1.5 hours in a French door that my brother will, will attest. Right? I was stuck because the door was locked. It was reinforced with metal, and I couldn't get out. I was thinking I was just screaming for help. Right? Uh, and uh, I thought. They are taking their break. Oh, Jean-Jacques, do I hear something? Uh, I think ignore it. Life is too short. <laughs> Let's enjoy our three-hour break. Right? Right. So I had quite a lot of uh, interesting experience uh, in Paris. Experiences in Paris. What I meant to say is you're very happy. So the yeah, oh, you said content. Uh, yes, content. Well, content. Well, right? you, this is an excellent baker because the set of dissatisfaction is the empty set, right? You point at A, you will get A in your in your in your meal in your box. You point at B, you get it, right? You point at C, you don't get onion soup, right? Or okay, so you understand? But notice the empty set is not one; of, it's still an element of the power set, but not one that I can build, but one that I can produce. Do you understand? That, so, in the finite example, again, it's not really important. But let me try to, uh, do I have time to go through the argument? Four minutes. Four minutes. I'll do my best to uh, rush through it and then uh, see, right? See, see if you get So, uh, here, is, here is the argument. The argument is that F uh, so so the, the, the set S sub F is not in range of the function F from A to the power set of A. So in other words, F is not on to. That's what's going to happen, okay? So the idea is for, for any different f, I will produce a set of dissatisfaction, and the function f is not onto the set of dissatisfaction. Here is why. So suppose that sf is in range. In other words, I can produce it. That, that means that there exists a y belonging to a such that f of y is equal to that set s sub f. Okay? So there exists a candy that I will point at and it will give me the candies uh, of the set of dissatisfaction. Okay? It was not true in this example. Notice there, there was only a, b, c, so I had to only check finite many uh, cases and this set is, I can never get this box from this baker. So if you have this, so then you can you go as follows. So, so you can say, that they must contain, they are sets. They must contain the same, the same candies, or the same elements of A. So one thing I can say, if Y is an element of F of Y, by definition, Y is not an element of S sub F. S sub F was defined as the things that are not inside of the, of the box that when you point it, right? So if I say, okay, if y produces it, let's see what happens if I point at y. For those sets to be the same, y must be in the box. But if it's in the box, by definition, it's not in the set of dissatisfaction. So that doesn't work. On the other hand, is if y isn't an element of f of y, by definition, y is an element of the set of dissatisfaction. So there is no way that they have the same number of elements, or the same, don't forget about number, the same elements. Because in the very least, they differ by this one y. This one y cannot be in both sets. It's in one or the other. Okay? And either y is or isn't. In both, in both, in both cases, those sets uh, cannot both contain y, or cannot both not contain y. And that's the argument, you understand? So no map is onto. That tells you that 
if you take the power set, you produce a bigger infinity. Now you can make recursion. You can take the power set of the power set, you'll produce a bigger infinity. What this is saying is that there is no biggest infinity. For every one that you have, you can produce a set of higher cardinality, of infinity that is much bigger. That will be enough for today. Uh, bring the homework on Wednesday. Goodbye. Merci beaucoup. Bitte sehr.